Well, we've already given the, away the, the secret that today is the first Sunday of Advent, and uh, we are launching a, a new series through the book of Ruth. Um, we already got a little bit of a preview of that in the, uh, in the candle reading there, and I know some of you have been talking about it for the last couple of weeks, but uh, some of you might be wondering what in the world Ruth has to do with Advent and Christmas. I'm glad I asked that question. Um, because uh, Ruth is in the Old Testament, right? And the Christmas story is in the New Testament. Well, we do go to the New Testament, to the Gospels, to get the details of the Christmas story of, of the, the angels and Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the wise men and, and of course, Jesus. But the, the events and, and the story of Christmas, the roots go much deeper and farther back than than first century, than, than, than the New Testament. In fact, they go all the way back to the Old Testament, which we did last year. You remember we went through the book of Isaiah and, and, and looked at how he looked forward to the coming of the Christ child. And uh, really, that's what the Old Testament does. It points forward to the new. In fact, we could, do, uh, we could have done a, an Advent series entitled The Old Testament, A Christmas Story. Uh, but we're going we're, we're to stay in one book uh, and, and the book of Ruth really is a, it's a, it's a particularly appropriate book to go through and read as a Christmas story for a few reasons. For one thing, uh, the book of Ruth is just that. It's a story. It's, it's a short story contained in four short chapters with a few main characters and the part that they played in the, God's plan to, to redeem the, the world. The Christmas story is a short story covering a few brief chapters with a few main characters and the parts that they played in God's plan to bring Jesus into the world and to redeem the world. It's also appropriate because what we'll see, how we'll see, the events of Ruth bear directly on the events of Christmas. For example, it is no coincidence that the events in Ruth and the events in the Christmas story take place in the same town, Bethlehem. In fact, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem is largely connected and is because of a lot of the events that we're going to read about that take place in the book of Ruth. So there's a direct connection between the two stories. And lastly, as we make our way through this, and, and, and I will tell you there's a lot, we're going to, there's a lot of Scripture in, in this series over these next four weeks. And uh, we're not going to read from beginning to end the story of Ruth, but we are going to go through it a, a, a few verses at a time, as well as from time to time, we're going to read the Christmas story alongside, and we can see, make those connections. But we'll see all sorts of parallels between these two stories. The Christmas story is the story of a young woman who makes a radical commitment of faith to God and then journeys to Bethlehem where she gives birth to a son who would change the world. The book of Ruth is about, wait for it, a young woman who makes a radical commitment of faith to God and then journeys to Bethlehem where she gives birth to a son through whom the world would never be the same. And Ruth herself, much like her Christmas counterpart, Mary, is a very unlikely character, person, through whom these events happen. Unlike Mary, though, uh, and this is, this is one of the things that makes Ruth's story even more remarkable, was that she was not a Jew. She was a Moabite. And if you know anything about the Moabites and the Jews, they did not get along. They were hated enemies, sworn enemies of each other. And so, and so the question is, how, in, how did this, this young woman, this young Moabite woman named Ruth, come to have faith in God? How did she journey to Bethlehem? And what does all of this have to do with Advent and Christmas? Well, to answer that question, we need to start with another story, another person, and that's the story of a woman by the name of Naomi which conveniently is exactly where the book of Ruth starts. And that's where we're going to be in Ruth chapter 1. Uh, just the first couple verses there. Ruth 1, beginning in, in, in verse 1. 
In the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and two sons with him. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi. Their two sons were Malan and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from, the, from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they settled there. So the book of Ruth begins with a flight from Bethlehem. Which if you know anything about the Christmas story, the Christmas story also contains a flight from Bethlehem. There was a Sunday school teacher who uh, asked her kids to draw a picture of their favorite Bible stories. And one little boy drew a picture of four people in an airplane. And uh, she was a little confused about that. She asked him what the story was. And he said, well, this is the flight from Bethlehem. And she goes, oh, well, then this must be Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus. And he says, yes. And she goes, but who's the fourth person up front? It's Pontius, the pilot. <clears throat> and that's the last joke that I will tell this morning. So back to Ruth and, and the actual flight from Bethlehem. Well, verse 1 tells us a lot. It tells us that this story begins in the days when the judges ruled. Now, if you have any question about what it was like in the days that the judges ruled, the book of Judges is conveniently located just before the book of Ruth. And uh, you can read that if you want the whole story about how crazy that was. But the very final verse of Judges tells you basically everything you need to know about what life was like and what was going on in the, in the life of Israel at that time. It tells us two very important things. In those days, Israel had no king, and all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. These were not sunny days for the people of Israel. This was a time when they were not following God's commands. They were not living in, in covenant faithfulness to Him. And so, this famine that we read about, is, it, it's not a coincidence, number one. Number two, that it probably signifies not just a physical famine, but there was a spiritual famine in the land of Israel. And so that's where we begin in the, in, in the book of Ruth. It was a time of discipline, really, for the people of Israel, all part of God's plan to bring His people back to Him. So Naomi and her family leave Bethlehem in the midst of this famine and go to Moab, which, again, is an interesting place to escape to for better days. And they probably only intended to live there a short time, to stay there a short time, maybe anticipating that the famine wouldn't last long. I mean, <laughs> we're, we're the people of Israel. God's not going to let us starve forever, right? But as it goes, you know, they, once they got there, they settled in, and, and, and this became their new home. But life in Moab sadly did not go any better for them than life in Bethlehem was going. And we read in verse 3, Then Elimelech died, and Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah, which I'm glad I do not have to say any more than the first because I keep wanting to say Oprah. And the other woman, uh, the other a woman named Ruth. But about ten years later, both Malin and Killian died. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. So Naomi leaves Bethlehem to escape trouble, but ends up losing her entire family, her husband and both of her sons in the process. So the book of Ruth opens with it just a series. And this is the first five verses of the book. It opens with a series of terrible losses. Naomi leaves her homeland. She loses her husband. She loses both of her sons. She loses literally everything in this flight from Bethlehem. The flight from Bethlehem in the Christmas story was also full of terrible loss. I, we read the Christmas story, and, and it is there is hope and there is but I, I don't know that we appreciate how dark the days were 
for the people of God when Jesus was born into that world. In Matthew 2, after the Magi come and worship Jesus, we read, After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet, I called my son out of Egypt. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoke through the prophet Jeremiah. A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. Now the loss might not have been specifically experienced by Mary and Joseph, but if there were relatives, if there were cousins, if there were... There was terrible loss in the story of Jesus' birth. The people in both of these stories were no strangers to darkness. They were no strangers to loss. And I know um, that this season of the year is... We talk about hope and joy and love and peace, but this is a dark season for some. Um, here very soon, we will, come, we, we will come up on the anniversary of the loss of my mother-in-law right before Christmas. And so, I, our family, and, and it always seems that, that these days, if the loss hasn't happened close to the holidays, it just if you're alone, you just feel that much more alone. And I want to tell you something. And if you get nothing else between now and Christmas, I, this, I, get this. God is working in your life even in the midst of the darkest circumstances. He is working in your life even in the midst of the most difficult circumstances. We see that promise in Romans 8.28. We see God fulfill that promise over and over and over again in Scripture. Uh, there, are any, there, there are all sorts of us in this room, maybe watching online, who can testify to how God does that. He brings some of His greatest blessings out of the darkest and most difficult circumstances. In fact, it always seems that the light shines that much brighter the darker the circumstance. God was working in Naomi's life. He was working in Ruth's life. Even though neither one of them could see it at the time. He was going to bring good out of their suffering. And He was going to do it through a very unlikely source. This young Moabite woman named Ruth. Again, that's the first five verses of the book of Ruth. She's mentioned very briefly, if you caught it right there in that, those opening verses, as one of the women who married one of Naomi's sons before they died. And now as we move on and into the next part of the story, we see Ruth taking this huge step of faith that will change everything for Naomi. It'll change everything for her. And ultimately, it will change everything for the rest of the world. In verse 6, if, if verses three, 1 through 5 weren't, uh, weren't dark enough, the, the good news is we start to get a little bit of light in verse 6 because we find out, or no, Naomi learns, that the famine in Bethlehem has ended. And so she makes the decision to start making preparations and to head back to Bethlehem. And at first, her two, the, the two girls head back with her. Orpah and, and Ruth decide, are, are making the journey with her. But somewhere along the line, Naomi decides that it's probably better for them to go back to Moab. And so they, she starts telling them, you guys need to go back home to your people and your God and, and your gods. And, and, and 
neither one of them want to do that. They want to go with Naomi. And so there's this back and forth. You can imagine that. A mother-in-law arguing with her daughter's-in-law. Yeah. That never happens. That's, that's not a contemporary issue at all, is it? <clears throat> but she, they're, they're arguing with her, and, and she, they keep telling her, no, we're going to go with you. And then finally, Orpah makes the decision to go back to, to Moab. But Ruth refuses. And the story tells us that she clings to Naomi on the road to Bethlehem. And I chuckle when I read that, because if you have small children, or have ever had small children, and you're trying to get from one place to the other, and you've had your child cling to you, like hold on to your leg, that's what I keep picturing is Naomi is holding, or Ruth is holding on to Naomi's leg as she's trying to walk down. That's probably not how it happened. But it was, it was probably more dignified than that. But that's the picture that I get. She's not going to let Naomi go back to Bethlehem without her. And Naomi tells her one last time, look, your sister-in-law has gone back home. She's gone back to, to your people and your gods. You need to go with her. And that's when we hear these words that are probably the most famous words from the book of Ruth. If we know anything about the book of Ruth, we know these words. In verses 16 and 17, But Ruth replied, Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. Ruth pledges herself to Naomi. She pledges herself to Naomi's people. But most important of all, she pledges herself to Naomi's God, the God of Israel. It reminds me a lot of, uh, Paul talks about the Thessalonians turning from idols to serve the living and true God. That's what we see Ruth doing here. Orpah goes back home. She goes back to her people and her gods. But Ruth makes this radical break from her people, from her past, to, to everything she's ever known. And she commits herself to faith in the Lord, the God of Israel. And notice here, Ruth is making a lifelong commitment. She's not, I'll go to Bethlehem with you and I'll try this out for a time and if it doesn't work out, I'll go back to Moab. No. She's not just committed to Naomi until she's gone. She commits to serving the Lord in Israel for the rest of of her own life. She says, wherever you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. She chooses to be buried with God's people rather than her own, which, which means she has made a choice, an eternal choice, to be, to be cut off from her own life, from, from everything she's ever known. And I don't know that we really appreciate how radical a step of faith this was. She's a Moabite. She has no idea what's going to happen to her when she gets to Bethlehem. Naomi was right. It made a whole lot more sense for both of them to go back home. Yes, they were widows. She was a widow. But at least they were going to be among their own people. They probably weren't going to be in a whole lot of danger. There's no telling what's going to happen to them when they get to Bethlehem. But Ruth makes a choice, again, that would not only change her and Naomi's life, but it would have repercussions that would echo throughout eternity. And if you're anything like me when I read this story, and your mind has probably already gone there, I cannot help but think of another young woman who made a radical commitment of faith to God. Mary. God sends the angel Gabriel to her with some startling news about what's about to happen to her. Don't be afraid, Mary. Yeah, easy for you to say, Gabriel. <clears throat> for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. There was a spoiler in there. 
if you want to know where this book's going. You can go back and read that later. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. Perfectly logical question. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month for the Word of God will never fail. And then Mary speaks her radical words of faith. And this is one of my favorite verses in all. I, I love, I love this verse. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Uh, some versions will say, and this is the way that I play it in my head, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me exactly as you have said. No negotiation. No, well, I'll do this, but, it, but if it means... No. M let everything that you have said about me come true. Mary submitted in the, in the exact same way that Ruth did. In this radical obedience to the Word that God gave her through the angel. And just like Ruth, it was a difficult obedience. It meant endangering her life. It meant tarnishing and, and likely ruining her reputation. It meant she was risk losing her relationship with Joseph to whom she was engaged to be married. Because Joseph's going to have some questions. But just like Ruth, Mary laid it all on the line. This was a lifelong commitment because what was about to happen was going to forever alter her life. She laid it all on the line and she made a radical commitment of faith that would change the world. We hear a lot about wanting to change the world and there's all sorts of programs and, and, uh, and ideas about how to do that. But here's... Here's the important thing about changing the world, and we see this in, in Ruth and Na or in Ruth and, and Mary. We cannot accomplish anything of lasting significance apart from faith in God. True change, true change that is eternal, true change that matters, that lasts, requires a faith that is connected. To Jesus. Now, you may not change the world in the same way that Ruth and Mary did. I mean, uh, Ruth and Mary just happened to be some pretty major players in God's plan. But I will tell you one thing if you place your faith in God in the same way that Ruth and Mary did, it will change your world. Either way, like Ruth and Mary, if we want to see and experience and bring about real, lasting, significant change, we need to be people of radically committed faith to God. Back to Ruth, <clears throat> picking up the story in verses 18 and 19. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. Which is another. There's some humor in here because I can just picture. I, I, I'm not. Gonna, I'm not. I'm done arguing. I can't say anything to this girl. So the two of them continued on their journey. When they came to Bethlehem, the entire town was excited by their excited by their arrival. Is it really Naomi? The women asked. So when Naomi arrived in Bethlehem, it was the town was was buzzing at her return. They couldn't believe it. Could this really be Naomi back after all these years? And it is. But it's not quite the same Naomi that left a decade earlier. At least a decade earlier. She's been through some things. And she says to the people, 
don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. The name Naomi means pleasant. The name Mara means bitter. Naomi left Bethlehem ten years earlier with a husband and two sons with hopes for better days ahead. And now she returns empty. She tells the people, don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter. I went to Moab full and now I'm empty. Naomi may have returned to Bethlehem because of the good news of hearing that the famine was over. But she was in a dark place when she came back home. She was hurting. She blamed God. She didn't know why any of this was happening to her. She didn't know that God was bringing about good out of her situation. He may not have caused these things to happen, but He was going to use them. God was there working all of the time. She just couldn't see it. The last verse of chapter 1 says, So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by her daughter-in-law Ruth, the young Moabite woman. They arrived in Bethlehem in late spring at the beginning of the barley harvest. So Naomi comes back and she says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. But I find it interesting that God, through the narrator, who many believe to be Samuel, who's writing the history of his people, God continues to call her Naomi. God hasn't changed her name. He says, you know, I, I know you're suffering. I know that this is dark, but you're still Naomi. You're still my daughter. And I'm going to bring about good through what you've experienced. God has good plans for her. And we also learn that it wasn't just that there was news that the famine had ended. Um, there was actual tangible evidence that the famine had ended because it says right there the barley harvest had begun. Which means there's food in Bethlehem again. After a dark opening chapter, we start to see some light starting to peek through the clouds of Naomi and Ruth's lives. And you get the sense that things are about to change. For Ruth and Naomi. Sounds very similar to the world that Jesus was born into. God had been silent for a few centuries by the time Jesus was born. Israel, who had been so full and so blessed for so many years, was empty. They needed relief. They needed rescue, and they would get it through a very unlikely source. Now we've said that you know, we made reference to these as we've gone through this. We said there's a lot of parallels here between these two stories, and and as we close the the message, I wanna I wanna just highlight a few of those. <clears throat> the book of Ruth begins in the time of the judges, where there was no king in Israel. The Christmas story is about the birth of the true king of Israel. In Ruth, the people were in a sense very much like how Jesus referred to the people, like a sheep without like like a sheep, like sheep without a shepherd. They were lost, they were wondering, their things were not going well, things were not going as planned for them. Um, and arguably, depending on who you would have talked to in Israel at that time, the days were the same. They really didn't have a king either. Herod wasn't the rightful king. So the days were very similar. They were seeking relief and refuge. The book of Ruth begins with a famine in Bethlehem, <clears throat> which is ironic because does anybody know what the word Bethlehem means? House of bread. There was no bread. 
in Bethlehem. The Christmas story begins with the bread of life being born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. In Ruth, the people in Bethlehem were crying out for relief and they had to go elsewhere to find it. When Christ came, He came right where they were. He came into a hungry world, born in the house of bread to fill that hunger and emptiness. The third parallel, and we've, we've said this one a few times, both stories are about young women who made radical commitments of faith to God. Both journeyed to Bethlehem where they gave birth to sons who would change the world. God was at work in Bethlehem in the days of Naomi and Ruth. God was at work in Bethlehem in the days of Mary and Joseph. God is at work in Canton, Illinois in our days. It doesn't matter how empty it doesn't, I don't think you can start off any darker than what Naomi was experiencing in the first five verses of her story. Could you imagine if that's all we knew of Naomi? She left Bethlehem, went to Moab, lost her husband and sons, and was left with nothing but her, with, with her foreign daughters-in-law. End of story. I'm thankful that that's not the last we hear of Naomi and Ruth. That's not the last we hear of Ruth in the we hear of Ruth again in the New Testament. We'll get there. But just as God was at work all of those years ago, before, during, after today, he he still at work in our world. 